Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. I'm Dr. Scott Worden, the TOS guy. And today we have a beautiful day in California. It's the perfect day to ask our friend Steve Talikowski to do another presentation going into more detail on the Edgelow method. Today, Steve, how are you? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me. I really enjoy doing these. Yeah, it's been a tremendous boon. Our patients, our viewers, they made lots of comments about how useful they find your information. Today, I understand you're going to do some case studies. I am. All right, take it away. Okay. I look forward to it. And actually, I, I am not in California, right? I'm in, I'm in beautiful Madison, Wisconsin, um, <laughs> visiting a dear friend, Bridget. So, um, and it's cold here. <laughs> so, but I'm in the hotel room, so that's, that's where I'm at today. And so I'm not in my normal settings. But let me start off. We're going to do some uh, case studies. It's going to be a little different um, in that they're going to be a little bit more generic. Uh, not, but I sort of, sort of maybe a fictitious patient. But I think uh, once we get through this, you'll see the, I mean, I mean the reasoning for this. So, um, again, I I um, use the, the Invest program. Um, that's the um, the Edgelow Neurovascular Entrapment Syndrome Treatment Program. It was developed by Peter Edgelow, a uh, physical therapist. I worked with Peter for 14 years in the Hayward Clinic, where I'm still at. Um, Peter's no longer with us. He passed away almost four years ago. And um, I also have 29 years of experience uh, working as a physical therapist and 24 years, which is the time I started with Peter. So it's been 10 years since, he's, uh, since I stopped working with him due to his health problems. But um, there's a picture of Peter, amazing guy. He would have loved to do this, and he would have uh, appreciated deeply all the work that Scott's put into this. Um, and he would have he would have been the first guy up here to talk. So, um, so we always do an anatomy review. I think if uh, you can understand the anatomy, you will understand um, the problem better. So I'm just going to mention a few things and not get too deep into it, but talk about the scalenes. Uh, the scalenes are two muscles or a group of muscles that go from the neck to the first rib. They either flex the neck forward if they both contract or they do a lateral side bending to the side of the muscle that's contracting. What's important also is that they elevate the first and second rib during accessory inspiration or breathing. The subclavius muscle is a small muscle that goes from the first rib underneath the collarbone or clavicle. That muscle helps to kind of stabilize the clavicle during shoulder movements, and it can also, though, pull the clavicle down towards the first rib. Then, of course, you have the pectoralis minor muscle, and that's uh, a muscle that comes from the uh, third through fifth ribs and attaches to the coracoid process, which is actually in the front. You can palpate, this is a front attachment on the clavicle, I'm sorry, the scapula. And just understand that uh, the scapula has a lot of muscles attached to it. So movements differ depending on which muscles work together. But let's make it simple is that the pectoralis minor is going to pull the shoulder forward and away from the midline. So think of a rounded shoulder position. So here's a picture. This is uh, from Peter. Uh, that's the cervical spine. The scaly muscles are here. Um, can't quite see the first rib very well, maybe part of it. Uh, the brachial plexus is going through this space. Between here and here is the thoracic outlet. Uh, here's the subclavian clavius muscle going under the collarbone. And then the pectoralis minor, again, attaching to the ribs and to that coracoid process, which is in the front of the scapula. Another picture here showing uh, the scalenes a little better. The anterior and middle attached to the first rib and the posterior is attached to the second rib and the scalenes are coming through here again with an artery and the vein to the side. We're gonna mention this a little bit later, but these are the longest coli muscles. They're important in the program. We need to strengthen these. It helps maintain better posture and it takes some of the uh, responsibility of the compensation of using the using the uh, of the scaling muscles to help stabilize the neck. Another picture of the pectoralis minor muscle, a little bit better. You can see uh, there's no brachial plexus going through here, but 
as you can imagine, it has to go through the axilla of the armpit. So it's going to come up here more. And here it attaches to that coracoid process. So again, it's attached to the ribs. So it's going to uh, assist in breathing from the upper part of the chest. We're going to talk about that later. If you've seen some of my shows, uh, we need to start breathing from the diaphragm, not the ribs. So this is my first sort of my typical case, typical TOS patient history. Most people, they would say they have a gradual onset over many months and sometimes many years. They may or may not have a prior history of injury or accident. Um, <clears throat> I say that sometimes it's important. Sometimes people come in, hey, I fell, I broke my collarbone, I had a really serious ski accident, and after that I started having thoracic outlet symptoms. <clears throat> Some people might have had a car accident 15, 20 years ago. They're not sure. I still consider that any accident is going to start to, over time, contribute to a problem, okay? They may or may not have had findings, um, uh, x-rays, MRIs on the cervical spine, the shoulder, or if they do have findings, they're not significant enough to justify their upper extremity symptoms. And we're not talking here about Scott's MRI. We're talking about the sort of the standard, hey, I have arm pain. Let's check out the shoulder. Let's check out the neck. Um, Typically, the people are in a computer-based job. It could be software programmers, engineers, uh, developers, project managers, <laughs> executive assistants, healthcare providers. It could be any anybody. It could be repetitive work in a factory. Um, but it's usually kind of a high physical demand, repetitive job, stressful, a uh, lot of hours. So these patients typically are they they tend to get worse over time. And a lot of times it starts off as at the beginning, they start to get worse over the course of a week. Then the weekend comes and they feel better. Then as things get worse, the weekend may not be long enough and they don't get, they don't recover by the end of, by Monday. And it just becomes harder and harder to recover from their symptoms. So what they might do is reduce some activities at home or in order to continue working. And also at some point they may have a reduction in work hours uh, reducing the hours at work doesn't necessarily improve their symptoms, but it does allow the person to continue working longer. And unfortunately, in some cases, people are unable to work and they, they end up uh, either quitting their job uh, if, uh, if they have to. And I think the big point is they realize that their current treatment plan is not working, but they don't really have a uh, or don't know what sort of new treatment plan to pursue, or they may be pursuing treatment plan after treatment plan, different ideas, different therapists, different concepts, and they, but they keep ending up in the same uh, circle. They don't improve. So if you've heard my talks before, when, when we have a patient, a thoracic outlet patient come in, um, that first visit, I'm always looking for objective and subjective signs. Um, Objective signs are things you can measure. In this case, hand temperature, we have decreased range of motion, usually of the upper arm and neck. So if you raise your arm, you start to feel a tension in the arm before you're supposed to feel it. Sometimes as soon as you raise your arm, you feel this pull down your arm. So it's a nerve tension sign. They have strength deficits. These are things we can measure. They could have swelling up in the thoracic outlet area color changes in the hand. The subjective signs are things that the person describes, things like pain, aching, burning, tightness, a feeling of fatigue. We're not talking about the strength, but just to feel that my arm, just after even a few minutes, just gets so tired and heavy. Again, it's a feeling. Uh, then there's numbness and tingling. It's often down the pinky side of the hand and down the arm. It kind of comes up sometimes through the armpit, uh, up through the front of the, of the chest. So here's the typical course of treatment for that patient using the INVEST program. So I tell patients you're gonna have up to 12 visits of PT. It could be more, but by 12 visits or maybe even six visits, we expect to see improvement or we need to move on to something else. The important part here is those 12 visits can happen over four to six months. 
So the, what I, why I say that is I just want people to have a kind of a realistic expectation as to how long it's going to take. And I don't mean to get better, but to get to the, the later phase of the program, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. The first goal of the INVEST program is to calm down the nervous system. It is not to stretch and strengthen or to change the position of the scapula through scapular strengthening exercises, nerve glides. This is only based though on symptom response. The patients I see typically have gone to a therapist, they've done stretches and nerve glides and they've gotten worse. That's why they're seeing me. If you're doing nerve glides and scapular and rotator cuff strengthening and you're feeling better, that's amazing. Keep doing it. But what I'm trying to say is if you feel worse, don't feel like something is wrong with you. It's not the right time for these exercises. We also include core exercises related to improve mostly for posture and spinal and rib positioning. So we're not talking about sit-ups and, you know, planks. People say, I got to do planks. I want to get my core stronger. We're not ready for planks. This is more uh, activating the core muscles in the, in the neck, those deep flexor, those longest coli muscles, your abdominal muscles to kind of help improve your posture. We need aerobic exercise daily to help improve endurance. The other part is if you're not, if you're walking, you're not sitting. And we have to make postural training and changes to the body, but with this expectation of going slowly. If a person has a lot of stiffness in their thoracic spines, uh, in their low back, we can't change that today or tomorrow, we have to calm things down first. So I'm gonna give you the uh, treatment plan first visit. First day a person walks into the clinic, we do a history, the history I talked about, a gradual onset, uh, slowly got worse, working less hours, the whole, the story of what people are going through. We do an assessment to look at the subjective and objective signs and the symptoms consistent with TOS. Those signs and symptoms, not everybody has all of them, but there's enough signs and symptoms that it, it fits the TOS syndrome pattern. We start to educate the person on the TOS anatomy and the basic concepts of the INVEST program. I'm already doing that with people today. We look at pictures of the anatomy, the scalenes, the uh, the pectoralis minor muscle, look at the way the, the, the brachial plexus moves through that space. Day one, we have to initiate diaphragmatic breathing. I'm going to say this part about pelvic tilts because it's in the program, but I don't talk about it in, the, in this format because it's a little more, it needs more specific training. But we're going to start to initiate diaphragmatic breathing in order to learn how to relax the scalenes and the pectoralis minor muscle. We're also also going to initiate the patient in, in like positioning, and in this case, the very first exercise in supine, in order to teach the person how to relax the neck and shoulder. And we're also going to look at uh, introduce that relationship of posture and stress on breathing patterns. So day one. I don't expect people to change anything, but I want them to think about, okay, we've talked about diaphragm breathing. Now, when you're home, besides your exercises, I want you to think about how the way you're sitting, the way your stress is influencing your posture and your breathing. So here's a, a picture of a positioning for the first breathing exercise. And if you look at the bottom picture, there is a cervical pillow and there's a couple more pillows to create sort of a little bit of a ramp here. And then there is a belt. It's, it's a stabilization belt that we use in the clinic. The upper uh, picture is the exact same setup, except this is a t-shirt. The, the body of the t-shirt's down here. So the t-shirt is supporting the arm. The idea is to relax that shoulder neck pec minor scalings, you could say that too, but just the shoulder and neck position. And then we're doing the diaphragmatic breathing. 
this can, this exercise right here can cause can create a lot of relaxation and benefit. Now, here's a picture of uh, this picture was in Peter Edgelow's program, his handout. If you notice, the person's not lying on a pillow and they're not having their arms supported. So there are patients where this position is fine. The position of the hand on the belly and the chest is just to sort of, at the beginning is to sort of give a person cues on that as they're breathing from their diaphragm, they should feel their ribs or stomach come out and they should not feel their chest elevate. So a person doesn't have to do the breathing with their hand on their chest and their stomach. Um, but at the beginning, I might have a person do that just to kind of get a feeling of, okay, I feel my diaphragm, my stomach moving. I don't feel my chest moving. Okay. So the, for that first visit, again, we're going to instruct the patient how to take objective measurements before and after exercises. This is necessary to show the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the exercise. So the things we did before about checking your arm motion or hand temperature I'm not going to get that too much detail into that, but the, per, the patient is instructed day one, you got to take some objective measurements before you start the exercise and when you finish. You need to initiate daily aerobic exercise. That could be just walking, but it could be anything. It could be a bike, not probably a bicycle, but a stationary bike. It could be a treadmill. It could be an elliptical. Anything that does not aggravate your symptoms. And that first day, I said before, you wanna start the process of paying attention to posture and a breathing pattern throughout the day. So there's a lot that goes on in that first visit. There's a lot that goes on. And so what happens usually is we have visit two, I need to review the program again because people will forget things. It's just too much information. So, so we, and there is a handout, but I'm just um, saying. So we review the INVEST program and that first breathing exercise to make sure the person has the concept down. If it's appropriate and they're, they, can show, they can see improvement or at least prove that they didn't aggravate their symptoms, we start to progress the program. So exercises two and three will begin to work on strengthening the abdominal muscles to help pull the rib cage down. We pull the rib cage down, we're going to open up the thoracic outlet space or start to, and we're going to reinforce diaphragmatic breathing in a different position because exercise two and three, the legs are straight. We may add the ball and stick exercise for anybody that's seen the Edgelow program. That's a the pinky ball, and we use that to mobilize the first rib. However, we might also do the thinker pose, which is the next stabilization or core strengthening of those longest coli muscles kind of depends on where we feel the most benefit will come on visit two. We're going to add those exercises along at some other point. It's just going to be a matter of day two. Are we going to focus more on, on the first rib or focus more on the cervical position? I, oops, I'm sorry. I highlighted the last part part. You can only add an exercise if it can be proved to not aggravate your symptoms. It's not a matter if a person can do the exercise. They have to prove that they either see a positive objective improvement or at least no change. If you see a worsening of your symptoms, you cannot, uh, I'm sorry, a worsening of your objective signs, you don't add the exercise. It's not that a person can't do it. It's just not helping them. So we have visit three. Now we're going to continue with to review the program, what we've done in visit one and two, and we're going to start exercises to help increase thoracic mobility. There's an airbag exercise, and this is to restore that normal extension of the spine, right? We're, we're trying to get away from this forward trunk position, shoulders forward, the thoracic spine forward, Okay. We also do a gym ball exercise to, be, to begin posture training, and we're going to focus on relaxation and efficiency while sitting. I was supposed to be sitting there. And we're going to practice the diaphragm breathing while sitting. So if you look at this picture, again, what's the problem? If we go back to our anatomy pictures, we're seeing a forward head 
probably activation of the scalenes just because of that position, because it's trying to stabilize the neck. We see a position where the spine's forward, sh shoulder blades are forward. Remember I said, if the shoulder blade comes forward, we're pulling out the pec minor might be active while we're reaching for the computer. This is not to mention even the lumbar spine. So this is what we're trying to get away from. Here's a picture of a uh, person on a ball. Again, looking at the positioning of the, of the neck, the shoulder, just having a really natural space for that brachial plexus to travel through and not having this, uh, these muscles overly active opens up the, up the diaphragm and then in diaphragmatic breathing becomes easier. If you're looking at that last picture, it's hard to breathe from the diaphragm when you're slouched. Matter of fact, it may be impossible or it is impossible. That's why this position then encourages upper chest breathing and you have the upper chest breathing combined with these postural problems. And then you have more and more compression of the brachial plexus within the thoracic outlet. So now we're getting into visit four through eight. Okay, so we want to continue to increase gradually thoracic and spinal mobility exercises. Again, it's tolerated. We're going to keep with the invest principle of not aggravating your symptoms. We need to calm the nerve. I've, I've, this has happened. Every patient I talk to is that we need to calm things down first. So we're doing gym ball exercises where you lay on your back. We're using a six inch foam roller, a three inch foam roller, a pinky ball, which we call a rib mobilizer. We're continuing to expand our posture development because as a person becomes more and more aware of how to correct their posture, Sometimes what they find is because they have stiffness in their low back or thoracic spine is they can't really make the corrections that are necessary. We have to do things to help stretch the pec minor, but in a real gradual way. And then we start to work on core strengthening, which includes, again, those longest coli muscles, which are the deep neck flexures. We're going back to the thinker pose. It's like balancing a book on your head. So we're trying to get these muscles active in the front that kind of opens up the back of the neck. It kind of fits in with this whole alignment of having the neck, the, uh, the head, the neck, the shoulders, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, all in better alignment. Now, I said exercises four through eight. If you took our treatment plan, that could be month four, sometimes at the minimum, and it could be often uh, month six. So it could be six months in some cases, it could be less, but in some cases could be six months before we start to progress to stretching and strengthening of the, of the upper extremity. I'm not talking about legs and uh, other exercises. I'm talking about directly shoulder-related exercises. We can only do it when the symptoms are under control and calm down. And we have to prove that those exercises don't aggravate symptoms. You only add an exercise, like I said before, if it can be proved to not aggravate symptoms. It doesn't matter how anxious a person is to move on to that next step. If that next step makes them worse, they're going to lose all the progress that they made up to that point. Okay. So the INVEST program is a protocol, which means it has a series of exercises, but it's not a recipe, which means it's not this every person gets the same cup of this, half cup of that, a teaspoon of this, a little bit of water. It has to, we have to make the program individualized based on a person's history and their findings. We have to discuss the timeline and that's in part based on how a person responds. So if a person responds quicker, the timeline is going to be quicker. If they respond slower, it's going to be a slower timeline. It's just the way it is, at least in my point. Visits can be spaced out over two to three weeks in a lot of cases. Sometimes after a few, after a, the six or eight visit, it might be once a month because the person's working on a program that we've developed, and it's just a matter of working on those things and seeing a gradual calming down of the nervous system, an improvement in posture, a kind of a more of an automatic uh, diaphragmatic breathing. Like they can, they don't have to think about it; it just happens. Okay. It's going to be based on how they how they progress. So the first so the goal is not to focus on how fast to go through the program, but
but calming the nervous system. I keep saying that and understanding what actions aggravates the symptoms and what helps. So it's not only an exercise program, it's understanding what other things make it worse. So if you're exercising and the, uh, the, the classic timeline for exercise or timeline, the duration would be four times a day for 20 minutes of the breathing edge low exercises and then uh, walking for 20 minutes four times a day would be 120 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes. So we're looking at up to two hours and 40 minutes of exercise a day. Not always practical, but that would be the sort of the classic, that's how much time you need to spend on this. And understanding that even with all that time a person spends on those exercises, it if they're doing other things during the day to aggravate it, it's it may not balance itself out. So we need to look at both sides of the equation, okay? So case two, this is again, this sort of a, a generic case, is I call them the non-responder. It's a McKenzie term, um, but it might be a person that's either not responding appropriately or quickly enough or not, not having the expected outcome. The, the thing with a non-responding patient is that their history, their presentation can be identical to that first person who's making this gradual but progressive uh, improvement, third month, six months, they're 50% better, 60% better. They look exactly the same day one. The problem is they don't respond the same way to the invest exercises. So the improvement might be milder, which means they have a smaller improvement and it can be shorter in duration. So what happens, it takes longer to progress the invest program. So instead of maybe week visit two or three, we're already going on to the ball, the seated ball. They might be in that first group of four or five exercises. And maybe the ball, we're kind of uh, in that situation for a few more, a few visits instead of maybe one or two visits and moving on. The other problem or the other sort of uh, 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 characteristic of a non-responder is they tend to have more frequent flare-ups. Everybody has a flare-up, but these patients, they're more frequent. They're of longer duration. So sometimes it can be days and weeks even, or even longer than that, unfortunately. So if, when they have these flare-ups, it's necessary to kind of like back up on the program and to, um, to go back to basics again, because now if they're flared up, they're kind of more like a beginning patient, even though they've done some of the advanced exercises. You have to calm things down again. So we take a step back, focus on relaxation, calming the nervous system, diaphragmatic breathing. So the progress may re appears to reach a plateau, periods of no improvement, and exercises that might have helped in the past don't seem to be helping during this plateau or flare up period. And probably one of the hardest things is that the flare ups are kind of difficult to explain. And that's an important concept I feel. If I have a patient who I talk to and they've had a flare up, but they're telling me, wow, I had, um, had a really busy week at work. Things are really stressful at home. I mean, I, I didn't have a lot of time to do my exercises that's really helpful information because you can see this connection between I did this or I didn't do this and this is what happened. So we can start talking about time management and maybe taking more frequent breaks or stress management. And a lot of times those flare ups can be uh, under better control, not immediately, but we can start to work on that. The worst part is when a person just says, hey, I have a flare up. I'm not sure why. I don't know what I did. I don't really understand. I'm kind of doing the same stuff. Matter of fact, maybe it was even an easier week and I have a flare up. And that becomes hard because it's hard to tell somebody to change something if we don't know what caused a flare up. So, again, these are kind of we put people in a sort of non responder or they're not uh, they're not improving appropriately. 
So there's a few reasons. Again, it can be a chronic case and we have chronic pain problems. And the problem with chronic pain is it, it sensitizes the nervous system. It makes changes to the central nervous system, to the brain, the, the, the whole nervous system becomes uh, kind of uh, short circuited in a way, and it becomes harder and harder to sort of manage movement. It doesn't mean that that person can't get better. It just means that we need to take a different approach. In addition, we start looking at the, uh, if you haven't seen it, the Explain Pain book. Um, it's a book about, uh, explains the reasons behind uh, pain, what happens. And so we start looking at that. There could be some significant anatomical problems. Uh, you know, Scott's MRI would show that. And, and it could be that there's just a lot of stuff happening in that thoracic outlet area. And it's not just a matter of relaxing and breathing. I mean, Scott can talk more about that, but there's a point where it's amazing to have this information now because there, there, there could be a reason the person is not improving. And it's not the, it's not the motivation or dedication or the effort they're putting into it. It could be something else. There can also be sort of cervical or other multiple sites of compression within the thoracic outlet, you know, peripheral nerve entrapments like ulnar, uh, uh, like cubital tunnel syndrome, carpal tunnel syndrome, this kind of double crush uh, phenomenon where, uh, where uh, there's uh, compression of the, of, the, of the nervous system in multiple places. And that compression leads to uh, sort of the, the, I mean, the summing up of these multiple compressions can create more problems than just one of them. One, one compression site. And then, of course, there's other orthopedic problems. Person can have neck uh, problems, uh, disc, uh, sort of degenerative problems. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you can have shoulder issues. You can even go as far as like low back pain or thoracic pain. It makes it hard to do the breathing exercises. You can have knee and shoulder, knee and ankle pain, and hip pain, and which makes it harder to do the cardio exercise that's part of the program okay and then the biopsychosocial problems that's kind of a catch-all phrase but i'm going to look at it more as uh, people are just having a hard time kind of managing uh the processes or they're, they're there's a lot going on in their life and um they're feeling the pressure of sort of uh of living life and having this issue. I mean, this happens to everybody. So it's not like that's a sort of a separate issue, but in some cases it's even more, uh, it's even bigger, more exaggerated um, than, than just the normal problems. So person's not responding. What's the next step? Hey, I, you know, if they haven't already had one now, remember I, I see patients that have been, I may see a patient that's already seen Scott or Tracy Newkirk. Um, I may I may be the first one to see him. So when I uh, so if I'm the first one, I try to get him in touch with other other experts in the field. But but an MRI from from Scott would be would be a, a, a logical step to explain, get some information about what's really uh, anatomically going on. There can be injections right now. People are doing Botox. Uh, Dr. Newkirk uh, out in, up in Marin as a posture vest. I have a lot of patients that are using that. Again, sometimes they have it. Sometimes I, I see them first and I suggest they see uh, Dr. Newkirk. Uh, their soft tissue work, um, that's a bit of a hard one to answer. I have patients that are doing kind of myofascial release and are getting some good response, but I've probably seen more people that have had soft tissue and it didn't help or made them worse. Uh, the part that I'm looking at with that we can still change is that, you know, looking at kind of adjusting the program and that may include kind of increasing exercise frequency increasing their aerobic exercise. A lot of times patients come back and they're, I'm not really feeling any better. And you ask them like, how often are they doing the program? I'm, I'm doing uh, the breathing once a day and I'm walking three times a week. Well, that's probably not gonna be enough. So are you responding because of some other issues or is a person not responding because they're just not uh, meeting the expectations of the program? 
So a lot of times we keep a log, a diary of your exercises, their uh, objective responses, you know, to better manage a program. So if a person, hey, I can only do this exercises, uh, you know, once a day um, and I can only walk three times a week. So, hey, for the next seven to 10 days, I want you to double it. I want you to just for that for that one week, seven days, really commit to doing everything, doing it twice a day, walking every day, maybe walking twice a day. And let's just see what happens and see if by upping the uh, program, can we um, can we get you out of this category of non-responding into like an appropriate response? And then, of course, there's a surgical consult. And, um, you know, Scott has a lot of uh, the group has a lot of excellent surgeons that um, to talk to and all over the country. So there's there's our people to talk and we understand surgery is the last option. But for some people, it's still an option and it's a realistic option. So the, the third case is um, this might be kind of uh, one of it's it's more that the, the the patient is kind of there's some trauma or activity that cause these thoracic outlet or thoracic outlet like symptoms. Um, and the, the point being is that a lot of these patients didn't have symptoms before this. So this is this would be the sort of the sport injuries that we talked about a while back about uh, you know, this, like the stingers and the sort of the tractioning injuries. But for a lot of patients, like they, um, it could be from a motor vehicle accident, um, like a whiplash type problem. It can be from a fall. I mean, literally just tripping over something or falling and tractioning your arm, falling off a ladder. Uh, it can be sports or recreational activities. Uh, it goes back to what I just said earlier. Um, uh, or it could be just a person's... Uh, you know, they're kind of pushing the next step in the gym and now they're really doing a lot of push-ups, a lot of pull-ups, a lot of sort of heavy weights, bench presses. Um, but the point is these patients typically didn't have any symptoms before. And so it, it could be a thoracic outlet problem in a traditional sense, or it could just be a brachial plexus sort of injury strain. So what do I say? Well, <laughs> the treatment's the same. It's not any different. We still do the history, the assessment. We take subjective and, ob and, and objective measurements, you know, and it could be a chance, like especially with a, uh, a motor vehicle accident or some kind of a fall, there could be some added treatment to other parts of the body. But these patients, they can, they can progress quickly, but depends on the kind of injury they had and the time between the injury and treatment. So if it's, if it's a relatively quick thing, we can, and there hasn't been a lot of sort of uh, response of the body, the nervous system, the sort of the inflammatory processes. If we can kind of get that under control quicker, those patients can respond quicker. The motor vehicle accidents, falls, um, that just depends on the severity of the injury. And, and I'll tell you, just as a physical therapist seeing car accident patients, fall accidents, even the ones that don't have thoracic outlet, it can get pretty bad, um, at least at the beginning. So it's, um, we have two things to deal with sometimes. So it's, it's, it, these are, these, these can be hard cases. And so I just want to, uh, my sympathies to anybody who had, is going through this because it's, um, I would still say though, it's, it's treatable. We've got to just be really careful about how you progress it. So I'm going to mention just, uh, before I finish up here, the invest basics it's a summary peter used the call the abcs it was a was activate the core we're talking about posture and alignment breathing we're going to try to do diaphragm breathing change from uh, upper chest breathing but in, but if you think about breathing also from a meditation or a sort of a, uh, other a yoga type uh, approach Breathing is about awareness. It's about being in the moment. It's about understanding. It's feeling where you're at. When we're when we're not breathing, we're like holding our breath. When we're stressed, when we're not in the moment, we're our breathing pattern changes. And then, of course, sees cardiovascular conditioning, and that's we're trying to increase blood flow. We want to promote active breathing, and it's movement. If you're if you're walking, if you're moving, you're not sitting. We have where our society is. There's too much 
sedentary work. It's very, for a lot of people, it's very demanding work, but still sedentary. And, and my, um, my three words are relax, open, open the space, and then calm the nervous system. So I want to thank you. That's all I have. And I don't know if uh, Scott has any questions. Well, Steve, it's always great to follow your thought process with these complex patients. I really appreciate that. I'd also like to throw in my two cents that I think we all miss Peter. Uh, Peter Edgehill, he was a golden person. He really cared about people. Mm. Very smart, or maybe very not. observant. And I'm glad that we have you to carry on his work. Um, Close this up here. We, we, we have a lot of questions, but I do want to throw a couple of thoughts out there. I think you've covered very nicely that there are different types of patients in terms of chronicity and cause. I'm just here and uh, um, waiting for uh, Scott. Can you hear me? Okay. To uh, get on the other screen. Hopefully, it's not my problem. It's not my. my <laughs> it fault. may be yours because I can see myself on the screen. Find out. Hey, Scott. Can you yeah. see me? I can. Okay. I don't think Steve could hear you for a second. Steve, can you see everybody now? Yeah, I don't think he, I'm not sure if he did. We may have to have him log off and log back in. Okay, Herb, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, you're good. It's just Steve we can't see. All right. Let's send Steve a text. I apologize to everybody viewing. We're going to get to everybody's questions. We're going to log Steve off and log him back in. I'll address a couple of the uh, points I was going to ask with Steve. Um, he's pointed out how widespread across the body the dysfunction can be and whether it arises in the thoracic outlet and you compensate as a patient and resultant bad posture or bad habits develop. I think that's something that most U.S. specialists have noticed. Hi, Steve. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see myself, though. Could you see me at all? I can see you. You're doing great. Like oh, good. Cut, You look good. I just don't see me, so that's Okay. Okay. So I was just bringing up how much of the body TOS can affect from posture to pain in lower extremities. And I, I don't know if you have any comments about that, how to help patients understand that all of these symptoms throughout the body can be reduced and resolved with right treatment of TOS. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And, um, and you know, it's, it's like a lot of things. I mean, I think uh, in postural uh, attention to, I mean, there's a lot of issues that uh, are sort of created by posture or poor posture. And you could argue that it's, it's could be the, the neck, could be the low back. I mean, even things as far as like hip pain, knee pain, degenerative changes to those joints are uh, a result of improper alignment. So um, I think we just assume things wear out because we use them, but uh, there's plenty of cultures where you know, people don't have the same incidence of pain in those right. areas that we do. And uh, it's not, it, and they're sometimes in many cases more physically active than we are. Um, and not so, in chairs and at desks and using devices. Right. I mean, I would imagine, and I wish I had the number, but I, I would say most of the people in the, in the world uh, sleep on the floor and, and squat when they sit. So it's so we, and we're getting cushier and cushier. <laughs> um, but and you think we'd be better in some cases we're worse. So um, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. But I mean, I know it's happening, but I'm not sure how to fix it. But there but are some authors too. out there who have yeah, mentioned yeah. that once the shoulders come forward and the neck comes forward, that there's compensation in the spine just to maintain your upright center of gravity. You and I have discussed that before. Yeah, exactly. So, so really, TOS can end up in a resulting cascade of systemic things that change your whole body. Right. Okay, why don't we take some questions? I have other points I'll bring, but I think a lot of people have been waiting. I appreciate sure. that. And let's address some of these questions. So Brad, hi, Brad. I know you just followed us. Um, my physical therapist told me that TOS always involves rounded shoulders, but my affected shoulder position is backwards because my pec minor muscle is atrophied and very tight. Have you seen patients like that? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I would agree that a lot of patients have rounded shoulders, but but since there's other areas of the, thora of the um, thoracic outlet that can cause compression, 
I would say that it's not necessary to have rounded shoulders. Um, I mean, it could be something happening. It's scaling in the first rib. So, um, and I would wonder, um, there's, there's, I would, but I'm kind of curious about that question because uh, if they're saying it's, it's, if the, if the pectoralis minor was very tight, but the shoulder was back, um, I mean, a tight pectoralis minor muscle usually means it's going to become closer together forward. So I'm not trying to sort of question the response, but I'm just, I'm just trying to um, maybe go back to saying is, Sometimes the information isn't right, but I also would say it, it doesn't have to be a pec minor compression for a thoracic outlet. So Brad, uh, first thing I wanna bring up is we don't diagnose people specifically here. We can address questions like this in general understanding we have, but I recommend you get in touch with us through tosmri.com. Uh, if you contact us, we're glad to refer you to docs who are specialists in this. I'm curious also, as Steve brought up, how they know that your pec minor is atrophied. And I do agree that usually a pec minor being tight means that the scapula is pulled forward. So uh, these would be things that a good experienced TOS specialist would be able to address. I don't know if the person who's diagnosing you has that experience, but TOS is one of those diseases for sure where experience makes a huge difference. Uh, Steve, I'm sure you would agree with this you don't have a single sign that tells you it's TOS or not. E even on MRIs, there's not just one no. sign that shows everything. No. And, and I would also say, um, and there's some people where they're having symptoms and the, and the, uh, the sign and they're having problems that seem consistent with thoracic outlet. And, and I'm, I'm not, and sometimes their symptoms, I mean, their, their signs, their measurements aren't that severe, but I've always said, it sounds like thoracic outlet. So we're going to treat it like thoracic outlet. And then we're going to see if it gets better because if it's, if, if, if the things that we're talking about, if all postural alignment and, and relax and not activating the scalenes and the pec minor and breathing from the diaphragm, if those things help, then that kind of tells me you probably had have thoracic outlet, even though it's not necessarily that obvious. So there are some cases where it feels like, hey, I'm not really sure, but it kind of, it's you're describing it. I'm just not seeing it as clearly as some other patients, but. Um, so I Brad, I would say, Brad, if, you're, if your local doc has some confusion or is unsure or inexperienced, absolutely worth your while to consult either locally with another TOS specialist or over a distance with several docs and experts like Steve we can connect you with. There are, in the medical literature, many types of TOS. And when it was united as a term, the term thoracic outlet syndrome in 1956, it was with the understanding that there were many variations of anatomy and many variations of causation that were all being lumped together. And I think it's our duty now through specialists like Steve and other docs we know throughout the country to separate those back out into different causes and different anatomic variations. So we're, we're glad to help you personally if you get in touch with us in a secure way. Herb, what's our next question? Benjamin, hey Benjamin, thanks for the talk. You're welcome, thanks for coming and spending time with us. Have you seen severe patients with constant symptoms, Steve, that get symptom free or almost free to a functional life? No, I do see patients that, um, that go back to a functional life and I, I would, I would say, um, I mean, there's severe and there's constant. I mean, people can have constant symptoms and still, you know, uh, be at a moderate level. But I think what <clears throat> I think what's important to understand is that when when I when you see a patient, um, and again, it part of this is going to go back to let's say, so, so hey, maybe this person's progressing slowly, or maybe they just want the information. They'll, they'll, they'll get a hold of Scott and Scott does uh, an MRI and he goes, you know, Hey, I see some findings, but you know, they, they look like, uh, I mean, again, it's just a, I shouldn't say that they, what they look like, but, um, but maybe there's, maybe it's not so clear or it doesn't seem severe compression. Um, 
And so the person, I think the expectation then has to be is just it's going to take longer, a longer time. I think the more severe, the longer time a person has been in this condition, I would expect the progression to get improved. It could be longer. I mean, it could be a year. It could be 15 months. These are not unusual timelines. And then the expectation is that this is not something you just get over. Um, there, and people ask me some, a lot of times, well, am I going to have to keep doing these exercises? And I kind of go like, well, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like you keep taking a shower and brushing your teeth and flossing, you know, you got to maintain, there's a, there's a reason you got it. And if you just, and if things get better and then you just kind of go back to the way things are, then it could return. So I tell people is there's an expectation to get better. And I think it's realistic. And, but that expectation has to be, there has to be a commitment to sort of maintaining all these things that a person has learned to get better and to keep it. It's like losing, going on a diet and then yep. you have to sort of eat healthy and exercise for the rest of your life. And, and are there people that can do that? Sure. And there are a lot of people that can't Yeah, probably so, but I don't think there's a, I think when you get the right treatment, there's an expectation you're going to get better. Have you found that your patients who go through this and resolve all or most of their symptoms, that they are more sensitive to body changes after that? Um, oh, you mean, are they, are they better at... Can they prevent flares by being more oh. perceptive? Yes, but I, you know, I, it's, I think the, and this isn't a, I think the challenge is, is that, so I said earlier, like, well, what's, what's the sort of the classic invest commitment to the exercises? And it's like, well, it's, you know, four times a day for 20 minutes and four times of aerobic ex exercise, 20 minutes, two hours and 40 minutes. And so I think what, um, what happens is that it just gets hard to maintain that. And um, it's, um, I think I was going somewhere and I kind of lost my direction well, already. Let's keep in <laughs> mind that we've just talked about how variable the disease is. There's different anatomy and different causations right, right. in every patient. So a general question, can patients get better? We've certainly seen patients get better and have a very full life. Right. I think that the most dramatic changes are the patients who do go to surgery, but those are not all patients with TOS and it's not a majority. Right. Uh, what we do from good imaging, what we understand so far about the disease is that it is multifactorial. It's different in every patient. Some patients are surgical patients and some patients are not. And I guess in your experience, Steve, you probably meet a lot of patients who say, I'd really like to avoid surgery. Oh, I, I mean, pretty much everybody wants to, you know, everybody wants to avoid it. Um, and I, I think there's a, you know, there's a point where it, and, and this is where I feel, uh, and I think people want to feel like they've, like they've tried everything. And then right. so when, when a person feels like, Hey, I've talked to these experts and I, I guess I'll put myself in that one of those on that list, but they've talked to other people besides me. And I, I feel like a lot of times, when I talk to patients that have talked to Scott and Tracy and some of the other uh, people that we work with, they're all getting, and they get the same message. It, at least they feel like when they come to a point where maybe they have to take that next step, they feel like they've, they've gotten the right treatment and they don't, they, they feel less hesitant to maybe go to the surgical point step. But also, I think when they start to get all these um, people on their side, that's when they start to see improvement because now they're 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 getting the right information. They're approaching it in the right way. They're getting people that it's a puzzle, and everybody's putting their pieces in and and are right. uh, contributing. And so, the the people that I see that um, aren't are really severe aren't getting better. And a lot of times, I, I hear what there's I hear their story, and I'm just it's it's sad because I feel like. I feel like every step of the way, someone, and it's not out of, uh, I don't know what it is. It's just not understanding it. I, and these, these are, I got to believe these are good therapists and good doctors and, but you just don't, they don't see it. 
Well, there's a lot we don't know about the disease still. I think we have to be oh, honest sure. about that. And it's not low-hanging fruit. In most cases of TOS, I think you'd agree, you don't go see one doctor, get one test, get one treatment, and you're done. No. And, that, no. and that's why I work with people like you, Steve, and different surgeons and different neurologists and different pain management docs. We work with people all over the country because usually it takes kind of a small community of docs to help resolve all these different issues. But you had brought up before empowering a patient with knowledge about understanding the disease. Do you think that helps a lot of people emotionally uh, get through it? Yeah, no, I do. And, and ask, you, uh, ask that question again. I was reading a question on the screen and I was like, I was, I was, I was reading and not listening to you, Scott. So tell me, ask me again. I, yeah, I mean, when you educate a patient and empower them and they go and look up the Rassic Outlet Syndrome, which they may have never heard before, do you feel that helps them emotionally oh. and gives them support to get through this? I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, when I, um, if, if, if I talk to a patient who's just starting to get some information and, and sometimes I'm the first person, sometimes it's you, sometimes like I'm out in the Bay area. So it might be Tracy Newkirk, but, um, when people start to explain their, what they're going through and, and kind of in with an understanding of like, wow, this person understands, I think that's that's a huge first step. Now, the problem sometimes is is then the expectations are really high. So, um, or uh, and I'm saying you should have high expectations, but I maybe I mean more that the timeline expectation is too high. It's like, wow, well, now I know what to do, you know. And right. then you start talking about three, six months, nine months, twelve months, and it's like, ah, uh, I don't have time. I mean. People have everyone wants to get better quickly, chronic want to get better pain. quickly. And, um, and a lot of people are in, you know, in they're either they're in danger of losing their livelihood, they're having trouble right. just managing their home life because they can't contribute. And um, one more year sounds like uh, like impossible, but and I tell people it's not going to be a year to get better. I mean, we expect people to get better, start feeling better first month, but they're just not better yet. <laughs> not completely. Yeah. So to Benjamin's question, we do see people make significant improvements. I think we need to understand each person's anatomy and pathology, though, to get a better idea. Uh, I, I would just say that we're doing a lot better than we did when I first started 25 years ago. People get diagnosed more quickly. We understand their underlying disease better. So first of all, hang in there. Secondly, contact us. We'll put you in touch with Good specialists. Yeah. Carol has asked us a lot of questions. Let me read this one. I have left-sided neurogenic TOS and CRPS, uh, which is a bad combination. I'm sorry, Carol. Um, I can't run anymore because the pain in my neck and scapula go off the charts. Now, I love to walk, but my right foot goes numb and I get shocking pain in my lower back. Is that because my left side is now highly elevated and no longer symmetric with my right side? I look lopsided right now. Let me just remind everybody, um, and you too, Carol, we don't answer specific medical questions. We're going to address this in a general way. Right. Steve, you've already addressed how posture can change from this asymmetric pain. How do you address a patient in general who comes into your office with systemic symptoms and, and symptoms beyond the thoracic outlet? Yeah. So again, pretty common. So a, a person comes in and they have low back pain and uh, sort of a, a, a sciatic usually, a, which was a disc problem. It's, and, uh, and, and they're shifted. So a lot of times the shift is from the low back. So they're kind of, uh, we call it a lateral shift. And then there's, um, there's a cervical problem again, same thing with, uh, you know, uh, disc bulges, nerve, you know, nerve root compression. So, and then you have your thoracic outlet. So, there, these are hard patients to ha help. I, I would also say, but I, I think, and that's a case where I think a lot of times is you're looking at, I have a spine doctor, I have a neurologist, I have a PT that knows spines, but I have a PT that doesn't, uh, that maybe knows thoracic outlet. It gets a little, gets a bit complicated because the problem is sometimes people are, um, you know, the, the thing that they treat is what they focus on. And I'm more of the belief is you've got to, um, 
you've got to start with something that gives you the most improvement without aggravating everything else, you know? Um, so, and, and that's not really giving you a direct answer because I don't know what the answer is. Um, I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, the, we're, we're probably better, and I don't mean we, but uh, medical systems probably better at treating um, low back pain in a way. Um, and at least there's more people that have it and they're probably better at treating neck pain again, because more people have it. Um, so it, without giving a specific answer, I, th I think you have to, and I, I mean, I see people like this all the time is you just, I have to somehow figure out like, where do we start? And, and to be honest, I don't know where we start because every person's different. And, and some people you can make some changes by just doing things that, you know, on the, in the neck and low back that can help them progress onto the thoracic outlet. Um, so yeah, it's, this is tough. I mean, um, uh, I kind of agree with Scott. It's what Scott's been saying. It's, um, it's hard to say where to start, but there, there, there has to be a starting point. And that's just the skill of the therapist. The good thing is besides being, a lot of experience in thoracic outlet. I'm a McKenzie certified therapist. So I, I do have experience treating the spine and low back. I mean, the neck and uh, cervical spine and low back pop, uh, pain. So, so I, you know, finding somebody that has those two things could maybe be a good step. Yeah. I'd want to go back and see, uh, confirm how the diagnosis was made. If I were addressing this case and make sure that it's accurate and that we understand the cause the anatomic cause, because that's my my view, is I try to address anatomy in particular, both normal and abnormal anatomy. And uh, you you want to take one item out of that that you think is most important and start working on that. Uh, I'll also go back and say that to our previous question um, from Benjamin, I, I forgot to say that a lot of the good surgeons we work with around the country won't go straight to surgery they'll recommend a good six to 12 months of the right physical therapy before surgery. And so I'm mixing these questions up, but I, I Steve, I'm sure you've heard that the patients get referred to you by surgeons because right. they want to eliminate, they want to find out how much can be resolved. With sure. sure. Therapy. Yeah. yeah. Even a surgeon is not sure. Um, right. I mean, how much is changeable? How much is right. valuable? And, and I've had patients that, you know, the doc, uh, the surgeon said, I want you to start the edge low program, the invest program. And, you know, if um, hey, in, the, in the three months, uh, call me back and some people go, hey, in three months, um, I don't think I I'm not I'm not where I need to be, but I think I, I'm going in the right direction. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to continue uh, with what I'm doing. And then, you know, I have that option for later if I need it. Now, I understand we have a two-part question coming up. Um, Benjamin, hi again. I feel some sort of tension on the inside of my arms when I try to raise them. Should I keep my movement below that area? I feel like I wouldn't even be able to eat or brush my teeth if I do. And then would you say that doing arm and neck motion through the complete range of motion is part of the recovery in the early stages? This is a good question. Yeah, Um well, answer the last question first. Um, I don't. Uh, we tend we tend to sort of limit, um, especially as far as an exercise. So I wouldn't give people, oh, you, you have tension here, so let's let's just start doing some arm movements to sort of increase mobility. Um, so I would say is, I'm not purposely doing any arm elevating or cervical exercises to sort of increase range of motion. Um, that hasn't been my experience to be very helpful. Um, I think I think the reality is is that, yeah, a person has a neural tension sign at some point, and so anything above that is maybe causing more compression. Mm -hmm. I think the I think the idea would be though is that you have, there's things you have to do. So it's not that you cannot do anything; it's just that you have to you know minimize what you're doing. Um, because it's, and also realizing is that, you know, the reason this might be sensitive is because I spent eight hours doing this. Mm -hmm. So it's not that this is the problem for two minutes. It's that this is the problem for eight hours. So, so it becomes like you, 
And I always tell people, we just try to change the, at the beginning, just try to change things that seem reasonable. So, you know, work on your ergonomics, work on your diaphragmatic breathing, do things to start calming it down. I mean, a lot of people come in and, well, I have a lot of symptoms sleeping, like what can I do? And I say, you know, sleep is hard to, I mean, there's concepts of, you know, pillow height and cervical support, but if I can, we can calm things down during the day, things might be better at night. If I can calm things down through my, my other activities, through my diaphragmatic breathing, and then maybe, you know, this, this will go higher because the, because if this can go higher then then brushing my teeth isn't so hard anymore. It's not at the extreme range, right? Right. It's not the extreme range, you know, so maybe getting an electric toothbrush or something and mm -hmm. holding it like this. I mean, I'm not, right. I'm kind of sounding, I'm not, I'm not sounding silly here, but you know, you don't have to do this. You, know, you could be doing, uh, right. And then, you know, we do the thinker pose with some people or just, I mean, I don't mean while we're doing it, but just kind of get your neck in a position and then making sure that I'm not, you know, sometimes people are, they're in an, it's, I think we're, we're too um, sometimes locked into this idea that, that I'm, that I'm moving my arm, but there's a lot of things that are happening with the rest of the body at the same time. Very good. So is your head forward? Is your shoulders forward? So it's looking at things more, in a bigger picture than just like raising my arm. Um, so, so without the right expert guidance, you would not advise Benjamin or anybody to push their limits and try to do a full range of motion to make this better. That's probably. No. And yeah. And if you watch the thing, it's uh, my talk. It's, we don't, we don't add things or do things that if we can, you know, especially exercise, but Calm the aggravate symptoms. If it aggravates your symptoms, you're doing the wrong thing. Let the nerves recover. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Benjamin. Hi, Bakhtiar. I bought a copy of the Edgelow Patient Guide and the videos that Peter Edgelow explains the exercises. I don't have anyone in my area to help. I can't afford to pay for PT by myself to be continued. And uh, I've started Edgelow on my own. Have you, Steve, had any case that the patient has been successful by self-treatment using the Edgelow protocol? And is it possible to make some progress by myself, Bakhtiar asked? Um, well, of course, the thing is, if, it, if I mean, uh, this is going to sound a little, if so I'm sure there might be people, and I, the problem is if I don't, if I never see them or if they don't, con I mean, so the, if they don't contact me, I don't know what they're doing. Um, so, I mean, I have a few patients that are, um, and 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 the issue of like you know, insurance and and like money comes up, and and I, I try to be sensitive to that, but I also realize you know it's still a job. Um, so there, there's a lot of times where I'll I'll have I'll I'll say to a patient, it's still gonna it's still a visit, but let me get you started and let me do as much as we can in one visit to sort of, let's say, you know, and, and, and read all that material ahead of time, just so you, so we're not explaining every single basic detail. And then let's get you started. And then maybe it could be two months later, we could have another visit. Um, there's other, there's other resources um, that are available but, you know, it's it's supposed to be a self-treatment program. I mean, I think you need guidance. But um, but the idea is that, you know, you, you give somebody some information and then they go ahead and do it. And then they measure themselves and they progress based on their either improvement or if they don't improve, they, they stay where they're at. So there's some concepts there that I, I think people get the handout sometimes and they think they're supposed to do all the exercises. That's the biggest mistake you could make because it's not meant to be here's 14, 15 exercises, do them all day one. It can take some people six months to finish that protocol. Do so, you help patients out through teleconsults? Yeah. So I, so I've seen patients from around the, uh, well, uh, seen people from all over the place. Now I've got some patients from out of the country, but, but a lot of times I said they, they just, they might call me once 
we we just we you know we do a consult and then I know financially it's hard to keep doing that. So um, you know, just start get some principles, get the ideas down, and then and then like kind of go on your own. And then uh, so, and then sometimes people I said might not contact me for for a few months, um, and then we can it, it might have some more questions. I, I like to think that if they don't contact me, well, I guess two yeah. things could happen. Either they got better or they, they moved on. But um, that's, that's great if they got better and just said, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> yeah. I wish they would just call me and say I got better, but uh, right. I, this doesn't usually happen. Right. Unfortunately. Ashton, thank you for the webinar. Thank you for attending. Appreciate it. Would you recommend for or against wearing a neck brace for support? I read online about a botulinum injection into a neck muscle. What are your thoughts on this? Steve, if you'll take the first one, I'll address the second yeah. one. Yeah. Um, we do, a, and I didn't get into this because it's this, this is one of those, um, uh, but I mentioned, and i sorry, I didn't get in much detail. There's a thing called a thinker pose, which is a Peter Edgelow. Um, he created the phrase, but he didn't create the concept. So there's a idea of this, this sort of uh, upper cervical neck flexion where you use your hand uh, for just a little bit of touch support. And what you're trying to do is activate these anterior neck muscles. By pushing your chin downwards. Yeah, but just a little bit. Okay. And and there's a, there's a thing called a stabilizer. It's a cervical... It's for the neck and low back. They use it for strengthening um, uh, core muscles. And then interestingly enough, there was a cervical collar, which I've had patients get. Uh, it's called the headmaster collar. And it kind of recreates this uh, thinker pose position. It's just a collar with a little pad and it's a kind of a wire frame. So it's not a full on um, like a cervical collar um, you know, and cervical collars are great for if a person has an instability. Um, but we're, we're with this headmaster collar or the thinker poses, you're trying to strengthen those core muscles to sort of help align the neck. So the difference is, is there, it's more of an active collar or this is more mm -hmm. of an active movement where I think a collar by itself is just, it's just there to stabilize and it probably doesn't give a person any, um, well, it does not um, allow the person to get their neck muscles stronger. So I would say um, yes and no, <laughs> based on what I just said. Uh, Ashton, as regards injections, um, they were first done, to the best of my knowledge, in the 70s in the Los Angeles area, which was one of the areas in the country that was earlier in recognizing TOS. And they did these injections under guidance by um, electrodes so they could kind of guess which muscle it was in. I don't know that's so accurate. And they would inject lidocaine. And there are some studies that are constructed, I guess, the best way they could construct them. If a patient had reduced symptoms by getting lidocaine, which is a short-acting anesthetic. And if they got a lidocaine injection into, theoretically, the anterior scaling muscle and they got better symptoms then they would go to surgery and they did better theoretically. But there was no control group of people who didn't get relief and went to surgery or people who did get relief but didn't go to surgery, if you follow me. So this kind of started this path where a lot of surgeons will say, if I do an injection into this muscle and you feel better, that's a strong indicator to go to surgery. I'm, I'm not convinced by the literature on that personally. However, I have experience doing these injections and patients clearly get better. Now, you have to be careful. The technique of doing this may just allow this anesthetic to just seep out around the muscle and contact the brachial plexus, which would numb it up, which would explain why you feel better. But that's not a solution to the underlying problem. Um, but clearly some patients get better and I've done these injections and I think I've done them properly where the injectate went into the muscle and patients had relief. Don't know why it happens. I'm not convinced uh, reasonably that it should indicate surgery, but some docs will use it as that diagnostic to go to surgery or to confirm the diagnosis of TOS, which I think we do much better with imaging. 
We're showing all the anatomy beautifully in imaging. Right, right. Secondly, some docs will do it to allow a patient to relieve some pain and get to a better physical therapy position where they can start breaking this vicious cycle of tight, short muscles and moving it to make the muscle even shorter for relief and then having the muscle get tighter and shorter. So to break that cycle, some people will do injections with botulinum toxin, which can last three to six months if it has an effect. The challenge with that is that the second and third injections just don't work as well. So again, it's not a long-term solution. Anyway, there's a lot of medical literature on it. That's kind of an overview of it. I hope that's helpful as a starting point. Juan, hi Juan. Can cervical rectification cause TOS or vice versa? Regards from Ecuador. Hey, thanks for viewing from Ecuador. So by cervical rectification, I don't know, um, Steve, maybe he means reduction of lordosis and straightening of the neck, maybe. Um, Juan, if you want to clarify, just post another comment. But uh, assuming if you reduce the cervical lordosis, uh, that means the curvature of the cervical spine is straightened out. We tend to see that in patients who have tight muscles, uh, motor vehicle accidents, patient get muscle strain, and then you can see the cervical spine straightens rather than being curved. And I, I'm not so sure that that would help uh, resolve TOS or cause TOS. I'm guessing it's more of a secondary sign of other things going on like pain or tight muscles. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, I was, I was actually uh, Googling it. <laughs> oh, good. See what, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, uh, wow, it's a, um, are they saying, I don't, I don't actually, um, I don't actually know the answer. I'm not quite sure what they're doing with us, with this oh, technique. Actually, so, but I, I would agree that I think uh, a lot of, I don't, I don't see a lot of cervical issues being the result of causing TOS, I think they exist together or they can exist together, but I, I don't feel like uh, generally. Um, Thanks, um, one, that, one clarified. Okay, yeah. but, I, but, oh, I see. Oh, I see. So you're just saying is that uh, having a losing it. So there's not a technique that's causing, we're not using a technique. Um, yeah, I don't feel that kind of having a loss of lordosis in the neck, it was the cause of thoracic outlet. I mean, I, th I think it's a very interesting question because I think a lot of people first look at x-rays of the cervical spine. In my field, Steve, you know, I'll get a lot, you read the literature too. A lot of surgeons say all you need is a cervical spine x-ray and then they'll comment on the loss of lordosis. Now to me, I could make myself look like I've lost a lordosis just by assuming a position. So right. you don't know on an x-ray, is it because the patient is forced into that by muscle spasm or are they just... Are they being propped up by the technologist with a pillow under their head, which could cause the same appearance? So in the old days, radiologists would look at that and say, well, that suggests the muscles of the neck are tight, but it's the cervical spine is very mobile one. So it could be just a one-time thing, or it could be really there and unresolvable just by trying to bend the neck backwards. But Steve's point that he's adding, I think is a really good point as well. Most of the patients I see on MRI and most of the patients Steve sees are going to be younger and less likely to have cervical spine disease. And correct me, Steve, if I'm wrong as I go through this. Well, you're right. They, they don't have degenerative discs or bulging discs or degenerative joint disease that causes narrowing of the side holes. You know, the spinal cord goes down the central canal. A bulging disc or herniation can tap on the spinal cord. The nerves come out the sides before they enter the thoracic outlet. Those side holes are bony. They're called neural foramina, and they narrow as you get older because of some degenerative stuff. But most of the cervical spines I see are young and healthy, and that helps us separate out that disease from thoracic outlet syndrome. Steve, thoughts? Yeah, and also I would also add, I, I don't think the cervical spine alignment is going to exist independent of the lumbar and thoracic alignment. So hmm. if, if we're if we're looking at a patient, I'm looking at, you know, how their what their you know sitting posture is, then and, it, and this is in the invest program, there is there are exercises that go all the way from the pelvis to the upper cervical spine because each piece 
you know, like, I mean, the neck kind of, I almost go back the other way. I think the neck sort of follows what the, what the pelvis is first the pelvis, then the lumbar spine, then the thoracic spine, and then the, then the cervical spine. So if you're going to, if we're going to fix the cervical spine and we talk to patients about this all time, all the time, we have to work on, start working on the pelvis positioning. Um, yeah. If you bring your shoulders and your head forward, Steve, you've got to get more lumbar curvature just to balance right. to keep your yeah, center you, of gravity over your feet. Right. So sometimes I think we're looking at this, the, the end result, but we're not necessarily looking at what's what cause right. it to start with. Good point. Thank you, Juan. That's a good question. Uh, Beverly. Nope. Oh, uh, Juan wants to know, do we know docs <laughs> in Ecuador? You know, I, I'm so sorry we get questions like this. I do uh, not. I wish. Yeah. I think though, Juan, by by telehealth, by fortunately with the great technology that people have developed, if you think you have TOS, it's worth a consult with a, an experienced doc. We can help connect you with docs, specialists like Steve and other docs who do their best over a Zoom call to try to narrow it down for you. So right. reach out to me through the TOS MRI website. We're glad to hook you up with docs around the country here. And I'm sorry, we don't know somebody in your area. Hi, Beverly. How do you find an edge low method practitioner? Well, one <laughs> way is to go to toseducation.org yeah. and look up our videos because we have Steve here. But Steve, in a serious um, manner, do you connect with other physical therapists around the country who are familiar with or want to learn the edge low technique? Um. Uh, it's it's a little unfortunate. I mean, Peter back in his prime, and we're I said Peter stopped working. I mean, he passed away four years ago, and but he had stopped working ten years ago. So ten years ago from now, Peter stopped. And if he went back before that time, he wasn't uh, doing well health wise anyway. So he hadn't taught. He hadn't taught classes for, I mean, I'm not going to say it's 15 years, but it could have easily, it could have been 15 years or somewhere in that range. And when Peter was teaching, he was, he'd teach all over the country. He went, I think he went all over the world in some small cases. So there were a lot of people that um, went to classes for the Edgelow program, but we're looking at somebody that's 15 years ago. So what's happened is that people just haven't, it's kind of almost become um, a little extinct. It's not extinct, but on the endangered list of uh, people having experience. Now, I would also say is there's got to be other people doing other things. I mean, it can't just be the edge low method that people are. It's either either you use that or you don't get better. I, I can't believe that at all. Um, so. <clears throat> I'm more, um, I try to encourage people to, if they, if, if, uh, and Scott can help, but if, if somebody has a, you know, Scott would know a doctor in New York, for example, and they somehow, they must be using physical therapists yeah. in New York that are, you know, treating thoracic outlet patients. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't have to use the Edgelo program. They just have to do things that, I see so many patients that they just get worse through physical therapy and, and not just physical therapy from just from their treatment. And if it's, if it's getting worse, it's not working. Um, and, and I don't, there is no um, edge low program kind of uh, uh, what certification list. Matter of fact, people have, um, you know, people have asked me, that's my, it's my goal for this year is to start teaching the class. Which I mean, would be awesome. I, I think I, you uh, and I can work together. I think this question spurs me on to say, maybe you and I need to create a registry we can keep on my website of yeah. physical therapists who are experienced in TOS. Right. I can certainly reach out to docs I know, and you can you know touch base with some of these physical therapists to judge how experienced or motivated they are. Right. It's, um, uh, it's you know, I've, I've been really fortunate first of all i mean meeting peter was like probably the you know biggest moment or uh, changing influence in my career even though I, I do other things but also by the fact that i sort of got this ability then 
by working with Peter to see people, you know, every day. And then, and so that's my, that's, that's where my experience comes from. I'm not any smarter than anybody else. I just have had the opportunity to sort of just see patient after patient. And, and, and I, I mean this sincerely is that I learn so much by, by seeing people and seeing different people and learning. And even to this day, I mean, I feel like every, every, every person I see adds something to my experience. And, and that's just the benefit of after a while, people start to call you and they, and they call you with problems. And I, I think it's just a, it's hard part is a lot of therapists might see a TOS patient one a year, two a year, right. you know, that's- and I could, I could see five people in a morning. So, right, that's very, um, very challenging for a standard physical yeah. therapist to address this complex issue without that training or yeah. experience. Well, Beverly, reach out to us. We can put you in touch with Steve. Right. Um, Brad. Hi, Brad. Uh, laying on my back makes my symptoms get better, but the improvements do not last because standing or sitting makes the symptoms show up in a few minutes. Any advice? I'm going to start out by saying um, it should be self-evident that gravity plays a part in this. Uh, I can tell you there are some imaging studies from the 1960s where they did inject dye into the arteries around the heart. It's kind of an invasive procedure. And then watch the contrast or dye flow through the arteries. And they did it with patients laying flat with their arms up and sitting up with their arms up. And it's clearly sitting up made more of an impression or squeezing on the arteries. So there's some proof of it. But obviously gravity pulls down the shoulder girdles and that can do a couple of things at least. One is it can bring the collarbone closer to the rib, rib relatively stationary, the collarbone much more mobile. And secondly, it can stretch the plexus more from the, where it arises from the spinal cord and reaches the fingertips. You're making that distance a little longer. So both compression and tension on the brachial plexus could occur. So I think um, laying down is an obvious reason why these things may get better. An MRI, I'm tuning my own horn here, but good imaging can show you really how how narrow those areas are in your body in particular, and whether that's a likely cause of symptoms. Steve, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, that's one of these things where um, there's more than one answer. So it's hard to give a exact answer. Um, You know, it's, I agree when you're lying down, if you saw that picture earlier in the, in the presentation, I had a person lying down with uh, their arm supported, uh, taking just sort of the length off the brachial plexus, sort of relaxing the uh, shoulder, pec minor, if you want to say, we're doing diaphragmatic breathing to re- uh, stop activating the scalenes and pec minor. But um but then you start going. Well, is it is it the shoulder position? Is it a cervical position? Is it uh, is it a breathing pattern? Is it um, because you're when you're lying down, you're taking part of the problem away, but you're not necessarily fixing the problem when you're standing up. So it's we're actually it's taking hard. many many potential causes away when you lay down. Right, and it's hard to say. You know. Um, which one, but is going to provide the most relief. But then I also say it's not really that one provides the most relief. It's that's where we start talking about. It needs to be, there needs to be a change in breathing pattern or needs to be a change in, uh, you know, uh, posture, cervical alignment, shoulder position, or needs to be activation of core muscles, uh, but relaxation of other muscles. And so it, it gets into this, um, God, if I could answer that that quickly, I, you know, it, a lot more. It's it's hard to, I guess. But the fact that it gets better by lying down, in my book, it's a good it's a good it's a good sign. I, that's great. I think it indicates that there is a compressive element. Right. Um, the rib and the clavicle being the most likely spot. Right. Uh, Juan, hi Juan. Uh, my left arm and left body side started to get weaker. And the right side of my body is very contracted. Is this a TOS characteristic? It's kind of a, um, a complex question. And we, we, again, don't want to give out specific medical advice. Um, Steve, is this consistent with TOS? Um, yeah, but I wouldn't uh, when you say arm and body, now we're getting into bigger picture here. Um, 
I, if, if someone said that to me, I would say you need to talk to somebody first. I mean, cause it's, it's, there's a lot going on right in that question. Uh, especially with this idea of like, uh, weaker. I mean, it takes a while for there to, to be, um, visible weakness with thoracic outlet. Good, good point. And even um, in the affected areas, the, the, right. when the hands get weak, when there's motor nerve damage, that's a more advanced longstanding disease. Right. And we say contracted, I would not, you know, I don't know if they're talking about it, a literal a contracture or just right. this feeling of tension. But a person was telling me that they're, that they felt like the muscles were contracting. Um, yeah. I'd say that would be another, I'd be having them, I'd have them go talk to somebody first because it, it's just not the typical, it's not typical. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Brad. Any standing position you would recommend besides standing upright in terms of arm or neck position? Um, well, that's another, you know, again, you have to see people stand. So, um, but there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of good books that I, and posture is a huge part of my program, but I also understand that there's people that have explained it better than I do. So there's a couple books that I have people just look at. They're just, they're not physical therapy books. There's one by Kathleen Porter. It's called, I think it's called The Natural Spine. And then there's one by um, Esther Gokale called uh, Eight Steps to a Pain-Free Back. Um, both really excellent books to talk about posture, both, you know, sitting and standing. And um, there is a lot. It's, it's You wouldn't think it'd be so hard, but, man, it's it's pretty um, – it takes some effort. It, it, it's like a relearning. It's so uh, – so I um, – um, but I would say that um, – going back to what you said scott earlier about like there, there can be just a problem with the kind of the the dropping of the shoulders the kind of the little i would say tractioning the pulling down of the brachial plexus i mean people go for walks and they're swinging their arms and just that motion is a little bit too much stress so we're looking at you know we tell people sometimes that they're going for a walk you know put put their hands in their pocket or if they got a hoodie, put their hands right, in the, right. their pocket just to, just to unload the brachial plexus. Maybe, you know, um, maybe you could give us the references to those books and we'll put them in the um, body of this when we post the video. Sure. There's a quick yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. No good books. They're very, uh, very helpful. And there are people, there are people in the um, Bay area that teach classes. I'm sure there's people around the country that are, um, right. Get, get in touch with us. We'll connect you. You know, as Steve said, viewing somebody's posture, assessing that is a big part of what he does. Yeah. Ashton has another question. In the Bay Area, the East Bay, do you have a recommendation of ergonomic services that will come to your home office, measure you, recommend what to buy for a workstation? This is a great point to bring up. I think uh, occupational therapy, ergonomics is something we really are in short supply of. Yeah. You know, I don't... Um... It's funny. I mean, we, 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 we sometimes go out and do ergonomic assessments too, but, um, um, so that's, that's one option, but, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's got a lot of things. There used to be several, you know, I say several, used to be a couple of, uh, like back designs was in Oakland or you know, mm -hmm. Berkeley and now they're closed. I mean, uh, there used to be a place out in, uh, in San Leandro that sold ergonomic equipment. And uh, it's, I think the problem is a lot of stuff's going online. And so there mm -hmm. aren't as many kind of retail places that are businesses that do it. So, you know, that might be a quite, I can't ask that question because we don't, um, I said either we do it myself or people go through their, you know, like we have a work comp patients and they might have a, they might contact an ergonomist and come out and, uh, but, you know, it might be a good, just a kind of a Google search could help, but it's a good, I, I it's some, that way. I'd done some reading recently on vertical mice where instead of having your hand on a mouse like this, you have it a little oh, more. Yeah. Like that. Right. And yeah. it, it doesn't, according to at least the literature, it doesn't change the pronation of the forearm all that much, but 
maybe enough. Um, no, yeah, and and it's for me. It's it's also more like you know how far is your arm reaching? Again, it's like your yeah. sitting posture. I mean, you're you're changing this one piece, and I think for some people, I mean, the pronation supination does make a difference. But um, believe me, I've had enough TOS patients that have kind of exhausted them. Well, they haven't mm-hmm. exhausted it, but they've kind of they've gone down the list of different uh, mouse options, and um, there's more to it. But not a bad step. It's just there's usually more to it. I think an adjustable height desk is helpful. I know because as a radiologist, when I work my day job, I'm just sitting here in front of monitors for eight hours straight, pretty intensely working. Um, I know it's and and right, and we have to having a desk that goes up and down. You know that you can adjust a little bit to get your shoulder and elbow in the right position. What you were just talking about. And it's a right. big big difference. And just taking short you know short breaks. Yeah. But also just understanding how your um, how your body is responding to that repetitive work and the stress of it, and looking at how your head's moving. And I th- think people start out great, and then things start to kind of um, kind of fall apart. Um, uh, maybe another thing I can go looking for ergonomists and try to find yeah. some people who understand this. Thank sure. you for the good question, Ashton. It's something to keep in mind. Uh, and uh, Ashton asks again. I just heard you mention injections. Thanks for recommendations on whom to go to in the Bay Area. So um, I can make three recommendations. Um, Again, if you want contact info, reach out to me through TOSMRI.com, Ashton. In the peninsula, part of the Remedy Medical Group, there's a Dr. Priyanka Ghosh, G-H-O-S-H, an early in a career doc who's very enthusiastic and knowledgeable about TOS. She does injections. There's also in San Francisco and south of San Francisco, a very excellent um, doc named Rowan Paul, P-A-U-L, who does injections of uh, many things and um, orthopedic injuries, as well as getting into some TOS injections. Um, In Sacramento, there's a doctor, uh, I think it's Robert DeMesa or Charles, I'm trying to remember, Dr. DeMesa, who works with Misty Humphreys. Those are the three I can talk about right up front. And um, again, I can give you contact information if you reach out to me. Um, There, Steve is available for telehealth appointments. Reach out to toseducation.org. All right. Hi, Carol. Have you ever had a case where the main onset of pain was only in the scapula up to the neck? After four years, this pain was everywhere and hard to decipher where and what pain to complain about. I'm now 12 years in after being officially diagnosed in 2018. I've tried every conservative technique and physical therapy has made me worse. So right off the bat, I would ask questions for a patient like this about how the diagnosis was made. Um, What uh, if she hasn't had imaging? Do we need good imaging to really understand what's going on? She needs a good physical examination by someone like you or some of the people we know that are experienced in TOS I mean, it sounds like she's suffering a lot and it's very complicated. So as a disclaimer right up front, Carol, I, um, we can't answer specific medical questions here, but Steve, um, how would you approach in general a case that's been going on for a long time and disrupting her life? Yeah, I mean, those are hard um, Those are hard questions. And I, I think, well, it's, it's funny when, and I not to sort of question, um, I mean, there's been plenty of patients where I've seen, and I think they kind of walk in the door sometimes going like, well, what's, what's this guy going to do? And, um, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but just they, they've kind of like, they're not sure what to expect. And I, a, a lot of times people are, are, they're finished and they say, Hey, I, I don't think I've ever had a, a session quite like that, especially, and even people that have been through a lot of physical therapists or a lot of doctors. So I like to think that um, there's still options available uh, for patients. And I, I think the other thing I've noticed with people have seen a lot of practitioners is they kind of have this, um, this mixture of all these techniques that they're trying at this in there. They've kind of taken an exercise from here and exercise from there and exercise that they do or don't do some may do. And then sometimes they, they, one day they can do them and one day they can't do them. And it, but it's just kind of a, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of like treatment approaches. 
and I think it's not working because there's not really um, a philosophy there. There's not an approach there that's where everything can kind of fit and work. Cohesive. It's not cohesive. So, I mean, believe me, I, I've had patients that have told me they've they've seen everybody, and of course, I, I know what they're saying. It just seems like they've seen everybody. Right. But, Terribly happening feeling. Yeah, they have not seen everybody, and um, and and I can't promise anybody that I can help them, but um, I can I can certainly give them a I think an approach. <laughs> That's an cohesive and, is kind of, and but approach. sometimes you, you got people have to be willing to let go of the right. other stuff at least temporarily. And I'm sure you've seen uh, patients who've gone through physical therapy that's been uh, counterproductive. You know, sure. not every physical therapist, just like not every doc, has the right kind of experience, and so yeah. and what they're just, used to and what they're used to may not be best for TOS. And it's experience. I, I just got to believe it. They're not bad people. Right. Um, you know, uh, there's probably it's people that I know that wouldn't. I mean, I, there are people that I know, therapists that I know that wouldn't know what to do. Well, and, you know, and, I have and, patients and, who come to me from other docs, Steve, and um, they're not happy. And, you know, tactfully, I try to explain that, you know, I specialize in this one little tiny corner of the world and other docs specialize in other things. And, um one of the things I hope, and most patients do see this, they'll get a doc who will say, look, it's just not my thing. Let me find somebody for you. Right. That's what you got to do. And I, I really appreciate it when a patient, patient comes in and said, my, my, my therapist said they think I have thoracic outlet and they don't really know what to do. <laughs> so you, right. you should see somebody, <laughs> right? somebody that's, else. That's the best thing for the patient if it's out of your field. And I would do the same thing if I saw somebody, if, uh, you know, if I had a TMJ patient come in, I say, "Hey, I know a couple things, but I'm not a TMJ expert." I right. mean, if you want to, if you really want to get the best, you need to find a person that does TMJ. So, and, so for Carol, it might be good to take a step back, clear the decks, and try to right. start with just start, one start thing. Start over. Yeah, start yeah. start Thanks. new. Thanks, Carol. And sorry you're not doing well. Um, AD85 uploads. This may be a long shot, but do either of you have recommendations <laughs> about ideal jobs for someone with TOS? Wow. Well, certainly there are bad jobs. Um, he says, I'm a computer worker with a sit stand desk, good ergonomic setup. That's good. But I can't help but feel that the computer job itself is continually hurting me every day, despite some progress with edge low. That's a, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, this. I mean, I'm curious to see if this person I know, uh, or, or they just mentioned, or they just had somebody else. So um, it's it's challenging to work at a computer job, and I, I think we're just not made for it. Um, and there's some people that can manage it, and there are other people that can't. And not everybody that can't ends up having TOS, they could have carpal tunnel or other repetitive right. strain injury problems or low back or neck. So I, I don't want to sound like uh, um, it's, you know, TOS is the only option. It's there are plenty of other options. Um, so it's just, it's hard because a lot of jobs seem we, we, I, you know, we have people in medical field and I wouldn't say that their, that their job is, only computers, but it's a lot of computer and it's a lot of uh, repetitive activities and stress. So I don't know what the job is. I mean, there's always that balance between, uh, you know, what do you do and how much do you want to make? Yeah. Um, you have a job you like, you've been doing for a while, who wants to start over? Right. So, I mean, I always try to encourage people to, um, and again, I don't know if I if this person is. They mentioned they were using the Angelo program. I don't know if they, if I if they've had any contact with me, but <clears throat> I encourage people if if you're in a job that you love, um, but you have TOS, we just have to make that that work because. And if you don't like it, maybe you should be moving on. But if if you have a, a job that you're passionate about, if you have a career, I mean, if you have something you spent a long time going to school for and getting experience from. We know we need to make sure we're just doing everything we can to make that job work. Mm -hmm. um, and and I mean I think there's 
you know, if you're working 60 hours a week, I'm not sure if that's, you know, is it, is it a matter of hours and, you know, maybe it's mm -hmm. reducing hours or, you know, so part of that is, you know, it's, it's the job, but it's what, what, what kind of expectations are come with the job. So anyway, and in this case, I don't know if the diagnosis was confirmed with something like imaging, you know, we want to be sure that that is, as you suggested in the beginning of your answer, that's right. definitely and, EOS and not one of the other RSI type injuries. Right. And I think I mentioned earlier, the people that don't respond, um, the first thing when a person is not responding, I'm saying, well, okay, you're working and you're not feeling like I'm making enough progress. Well, how much time are you spending on your, on your exercises? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's not that much, you know, it may be that it's not enough. Great. Herb, do we have uh, further questions? All right, so um, no more questions. We got a lot of really good questions, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I, uh, I want to thank you again because we always enjoy having you on. It's uh, great to see how you put your hands on people, assess them, the thought process you go through, how you organize the different courses and types of patients. It's valuable for me as a, a doc, and I hope it's valuable for our viewers as well. Oh, thank you yeah, for sharing your that. experience and knowledge. Yeah, and I see. I I just need to get more people uh, trained on the Edgelo protocol. <laughs> We're going to work on that together. Okay. I'd like to remind our viewers that we have an interesting talk coming up on May 10th. It's going to be actually the third time we've had a TOS patient share their story. This is a very high-level uh, athlete, a swimmer, whose uh, dad is a cardiologist, and uh, fortunately, he was diagnosed relatively early. With TOS, uh, Jake, as you see in the banner here, Jake Markham, a uh, very high-level swimmer in college. Uh, at, uh, he's been at a couple of the best schools for swimming. And we really look forward to his story because he, um, he developed blood clots. He had to have surgery, and then he's had to recover, and it hasn't all been easy. But it sounds like oh, he's going to wow. have a really great story to tell. Oh, so that's okay. May 10th. Okay. That's on toseducation.org. We also, of course... Uh, sponsor it through TOSMRI.com. I want to thank everybody again for, for coming here. Um, I can't tell you how nice it is to meet patients this way, and I hope some of you reach out to us so we can try to help your problems get addressed. Again, I'm Dr. Scott Warden, the TOS guy. Thanks. Thanks to Steve Talikowski, a great physical therapist using the Edgelo protocol, and we hope to see you for our next talk. Hey, thanks, Scott. Thanks, thanks for having Steve. me here.